Okay, it's recording. Great. How are you? Fine. How about you? I'm good. Okay. Um. Thank you for your service in the military. You've got a. Uh, um, your face is blanked out here. What happened? Uh, Brenda. Come and fix this. Please. Please, oh yeah. I don't take orders from you, Mr. Rice. Okay, let's see here. This meeting being recorded, okay. Got it. Okay. Right. Okay, so she thanked you for your service. Oh, okay, Ray, thank you for my service, yes. Thank you for thanking thank, you. Thank you for calling. You're welcome. Um, is it okay if you could describe your life before you entered the war? Describe your life before you entered the war. What were you doing? Well, uh, what age? What age? Um, before you went to war, what were you doing? I was in college uh, at that time. I was a, a, uh, just going into my junior year. I had about 60 units. And uh, that's basically what I was doing. My focus was college work. What did you grow up? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Coronado, California. What was your family like? What was your family like? Well, that's uh, well, there was no there was no family. My father was killed in an aircraft accident in the Panama Canal Zone in 1934. So my mother and my sister and I were living in Coronado, California. I'm sorry to hear that about your own father. She's sorry about your father. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did you have to work as a child? Did you have to work as a child? Tell her about your gophers. Oh, well, well, I was one of the richest kids in the city because uh, the city was overrun with gophers. You know what a gopher is? Um, no, it messes up the gar gardens. Oh, yeah, it messes up the gardens. They probably don't have gophers in New York. Yeah, there's too many people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was like it was... <clears throat> Uh, they were worth 25 cents a piece. So I would set a trap and capture as many as I could and take it to the fire department and give it to them. And, and uh, uh, they would give me a, an authorization to go to the city uh, auditor and get 25 cents per gopher. So I had a lot of gophers and a lot of 25 cent pieces. Oh, um. I was on the track team at that time, and so uh, uh, I could take kids to see Buck Rogers and all of the all the funny guys on on um, the motion picture theater and buy them lollipops. So uh, I had a lot of I had a lot of twenty five cents around. That's very cool. Um, where did you go to school? Where did you go to school? Coronado High School, elementary school, and San Diego State College. Were you married before you left for the war? Were you married before you left for the war? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, okay. After America entered World War II, were you drafted or did you, did you volunteer in the military? After war was declared, were you drafted or did you volunteer? I volunteered for the 101st Airborne Division 501 Parachute Infantry Regiment. It's all volunteers. Um, what was the training like for you? What was the training like for you? Uh, it was easy for me because I was in good physical condition. 
uh, from track and field. I was a runner at that time in uh, high school and I had two years of college running. So uh, there, were, there were kids uh, about my age coming from all over the United States wishing to join the 101st Airborne Division of 501 Parachute Infantry Regiment of which we needed about 2,000. And uh, the regimental colonel got his 2,000 by different kinds of activities that we were tested on. That's very cool. Um, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right, that's just cool. Um, after your training was complete, where were you stationed? After your training was complete, where were you stationed? We were, our training was never complete. We always trained. Airborne activities were a gigantic experiment. It had never been done before. So six nations asked their youth to join parachute regiments. And it's the first time in the history of the world that something like that has been asked of youth. So we joined and uh, we worked at Fort uh, uh, Tokoa in northeast corner of Georgia. It was a conservation con uh, the camp and uh, the top of the mountain was cut off and, and uh, we lived in old rambled shacks and, and uh, uh, parcels of uh, activities that uh, were varied. We, we ran ran and ran. We never walked. We never stood with our hands in our pockets. Uh, and uh, we saluted when necessary. Our training was uh, in letters A, B, C, and D. Training in A was all physical. It was all exercises. Uh, B was uh, learning about what the army is and who we are and what we were supposed to be. C was a nomenclature about learning uh, all of the guys around us and uh, what a parachute was like and uh, what do we do with it and do we pack it or well, just what's going to happen with all the equipment that we have to carry. And D, uh, letter D was uh, uh, packing the parachute uh, uh, under observation by individuals who uh, by and large uh, uh, knew exactly what they were doing, when they were doing it, and how they were doing it. So we, uh, we packed our own parachute for the first five jumps and uh, we labeled a card and put that on the backpack of the parachute in case anything in case anything happened we had a complete identification so our training was a b c and d and it covered a period of 13 weeks which we were not allowed to leave that camp which was 13 miles north of tacoa georgia out in the uh, georgia woods colder than the devil at night i wow. mean cold so we trained and we trained and we trained. And while we were even in combat, we were training because we were attached to the 101st Airborne Division. Um, where were you, um, when were you deployed overseas? When were you deployed overseas? When did you go to England? We, uh, after we finished, uh, Camp Tacoa, Georgia, <clears throat> in the preliminary training, and had all the rudiments of military locked away in our brains. Uh, we went to Fort Benning, Georgia, where we uh, undertook uh, phases of the training again. We had A training, which was again physical education. Tom, you told her about that already. She wants to know if. You went, uh, no, when did this you is, go to this Europe? Is part of it. Okay, when did you, all right, tell it again. 
She'd like to know when you went to Europe. I'm going to get to that. Okay. I have to while I'm going to port. <laughs> okay. So, Port Benning, we we uh, practiced our jumps and uh, we learned more about the parachute and the, how to integrate the squads with the platoons and the regiments with the regiments. So we had 13 weeks of, again, another kind of training, jumping from towers uh, 250 feet high uh, and uh, all kinds of crazy activities that were weed out those guys who really thought they could do the work uh, in the airborne units, but uh, couldn't do them too well because they weren't in too good a physical condition. So from Fort Benning, Georgia, we went to Camp Mackle in North Carolina and we trained again there and we organized on a division basis. From that we took about uh, one month of training there. Then the Tennessee maneuvers where all of us got together in the 101st Airborne Division and the 82nd Airborne Division and we trained together there. After the maneuvers uh, in uh, uh, that area of North Carolina, uh, we went to uh, Camp Miles Standish in Boston. And uh, we were there for about uh, well, about a week while, while we were processed. And uh, then we left for Europe in uh, an old uh, World War I concrete reinforced, steel reinforced Liberty ship. The entire regiment of 2000 was on board that ship. And uh, we convoyed to Glasgow, Scotland. And I could name the, uh, the wharf where we parked the boat and uh, when we got there. I got the mumps on board the ship and they isolated me. And I had sheets and pillowcases and whatnot. And I lived little royalty while the guys lived uh, in uh, bunks 18 feet high, uh, six feet wide and uh, two feet deep. And they didn't like that, so they went up on the deck and slept uh, at the gun mounts for the most part, regardless of the weather. So we practiced uh, all kinds of activities on board ship, how to get off that ship in case we were torpedoed. We landed in uh, Scotland about uh, January 1, 1944 and then went from that point to uh, a, a village in England called Lambourne, L-A-M-B-O-U-R-N-E. And our residence was there for the most part for uh, uh, January, February, March, April, May, and June of 1944. So it was training, training again. We never stopped training. That's very impressive. <laughs> um, did you do anything before you and your unit went to wire, meaning going into enemy territory? Did you go into enemy territory before you jumped on D-Day? No. Our, uh, our D-Day uh, jump was uh, at 1.41 a.m. June 6th. No combat before that. We jumped right into the middle of the, for the most part, the German activities in Normandy between Rouen, saint mary glace saint Combe de mont saint marie de mont and uh, St. Mary Glace said we were about 70 miles uh, <clears throat> of beach area inland, about uh, uh, two and a half miles. And our objective was to capture and hold four causeway bridges and um, roadways leading from the English Channel inland to a major city, St. Mary Glace meaning Holy Mother Church. 
and uh, most of the roads in that area led right nearby and crossed the pass of the city of San Miraglis. So we had to hold those. And, and uh, the Germans had uh, taken over Cherbourg, which was a major port north of that. And <clears throat> we uh, were to uh, occupy that area after we had captured the uh, four causeways. Mm -hmm. Are there any fights or bells you remember? Oh, Joby, he remembers every minute of every one. He had, uh, you had two combat jumps, one on D-Day, one at Market Garden. So do you want to tell her about that? What was the question? <laughs> um, Are there any fights or bells you remember? Oh, sorry, Shelby. Yes. Um, what battles do you remember that you could tell her about? <clears throat> well, the battle at uh, Carrington, which was a major city that had to be captured because the uh, uh, landing of the uh, sea forces coming in from England to France had to have a protected route to travel to get into uh, France as easy and quickly as possible. So we held those causeways, those roadways, so that they would uh, uh, follow the, <coughs> the uh, route that we gave them as quickly as possible. Hmm. Um, sorry. Can you describe Operation Market Garden? Market Garden, uh, well, go back to Normandy. There was 13,200 of us jumped in uh, Normandy. In Market Garden, that was in Holland, uh, there were 20,000 of us jumped in Market Garden on September 17th, 1944. So after Normandy was over and all the beaches were secure and the uh, <clears throat> military forces of six nations could land and go on in and carry the battle on through France, uh, we had uh, 18 uh, parachute drops placed in front of us. And so we would go to the city uh, nearby the airport and they issued us uh, parachutes, they issued us food, they issued us all kinds of new equipment that we'd never seen before and practiced with. And uh, the uh, reason for all of this was that we had casualties and we had to replace the casualties. And uh, the casualties were, uh, for the most part, uh, not well known. And, and uh, the individuals who replaced those casualties uh, for the most part had to be organized and uh, 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 set into the uh, company as best they possibly could, which they didn't do because they were frightened to death because they represented someone who had been killed, died, captured, or AWOL or something happened to them. So there was we had 38% casualties. So a large group of individuals came from time to time between uh, July 27 and September 17th while we were in England, getting and, re and repairing our, our uh, equipment and getting new equipment and more and more training with the new equipment. Mm -hmm. I understand you were at the Battle of the Bulge, so can you tell me about that? You were at the Battle of, uh, of the Bulge. Can you tell her about <clears throat> that? I'm not sure where to start, but uh, after Normandy, we went back to England, to Lambourne. 
we prepared to make the Holland jump and uh, September 17th, we were in Holland for 90 days under the British command and we were only supposed to be there three days. We didn't like that too very well. And then we didn't have showers or get cleaned up for the most part. So uh, uh, we knew where we were because we smelled bad and our clothes were dirty. And uh, we had beards and we looked pretty scruffy. Uh, okay. Next stop, Bastogne. Oh yeah, back to Bastogne. And from, from Holland, we went to Mormelon Le Grand in France, which was a couple of hundred miles into the interior of France. And uh, we practiced again for uh, uh, another raid and it never came about. <clears throat> All of a sudden on, Jan on uh, December 16th, the German forces had surrounded a major city called Bastogne in Belgium. And uh, the idea there that the Germans had was to form a wedge of uh, German military equipment between the British and the Americans because they knew that the British and Americans never got along in their military activities. So to split them apart would give the Germany, uh, German residents and uh, the uh, military an opportunity to work for strength. They needed time and they were developing their uh, uh, A-bomb and their uh, uh, rocketry and all kinds of newer activities. So they needed some time. So the 82nd uh, was given the opportunity to take over Bastogne. The 101st would be in reserve, but a battle broke out north of Bastogne called Saint Vies, and uh, they broke through and started toward the uh, Antwerp on the uh, English coastline. They didn't quite make it, but because the 82nd moved into that direction and left Bastogne, the 101st Airborne Division took over the defense of Bastogne. So <clears throat> we were surrounded, surrounded, and every time we went into combat, we were surrounded. So I took out so many patrols that uh, I just can't believe it. I, I, I wrote a couple of them up and just to remember the detail that occurred there. So taking out patrols, uh, they were for the most part uh, 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 reconnaissance, find out what the enemy is doing and uh, then report back what you have found out. As best, as best you can. So taking out five or six fellas, I was the platoon leader and uh, led the squad. And we got near a little village called uh, Nefe, N-E-F-F-E, -E, which almost exchanged hands between the Germans and the Americans on an hourly, daily basis. So the battalion wanted to know what was going on there and what kind of planning should be put into effect uh, in case the uh, enemy started an attack in our direction from Mephi. So I was to find out what was going on and uh, I never did because uh, as we walked down a uh, long sloping hill where the uh, ground was semi permafrost and there were patches of snow all over the place and we were in good military formation spread out quite far and uh, the best known is in a deep valley and in that valley there were just a pass a small number of homes and uh, barns and uh, farm equipment there was a sniper in the fifth floor of the barn and he was watching us. We didn't know where he was, but I had a, two scouts in front of me. Uh, one of them was John Thomas, and, 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 and the, the scout next to me was uh, Architect Sierra. I sent John Thomas 
uh, as we came to the fork in the road up the left hand fork of the road to scout out what he could. And uh, the uh, Texiera was next to me. Behind me in Texiera was a couple guys that were was some distance among them. And the last man in the uh, uh, squad was uh, John W. Curtis. Now, he was the getaway man. He was to observe everything that was going on and uh, record it as best he could. And if we got into any trouble, uh, he would uh, get back to regimental headquarters right away. So the uh, Lieutenant Bennett, who was now company commander, gave me 18 surrettes of morphine in case we needed it. And we did. Uh, as uh, John Thomas was about 30, 40 feet ahead of me, uh, crawling up the left-hand fork of the road, and the uh, architect here next to me, uh, the sniper saw me, and he thought my knee was my head. And the idea is to shoot a man in the neck between the shoulders and the uh, uh, lower part of the, of the head. Once you get hit there, you're through. You can't do anything. You're out of it. So wow. he fired and he hit me just above the left knee. And I thought it was broken because uh, I could feel the blood running down my leg. It was sub-zero weather there. So the warm blood is what detected. And I was under the influence of, of uh, uh, morphine because I told Texier to give me a shot. Of, uh, <clears throat> of morphine right away because I'm gonna be useless if I'm not careful. I wanted to stand up and check the leg to see if it was broken. And as I did, I put my weight on the, that left, left foot and rose to it and swung my right arm up in front of my face and, and uh, I dropped my submachine gun and my helmet came off <clears throat> and a second shot uh, was fired at me and uh, it hit my right radius and knocked out about four to six inches of bone there. And I was up there wiggling and squirming. The leg wasn't broken, but I was waving my arms and etc. so that uh, John Thomas could get away and Arthur, Arthur Texiera could get away. I gave the 18 surrettes or 17 surrettes back to uh, John, uh, Arthur Texier and told, uh, tried to tell him what uh, was going on and uh, sent him in as quickly as possible. John W. Curtis at the way in the back uh, of the uh, squad, uh, he had already taken off and I guess he knew what he needed to do was to get the battalion and tell him we're in trouble. So uh, uh, he left and I was there out there uh, alone in the uh, late afternoon, December 22nd, uh, at about 2 p.m. And uh, time went by fast. So it got to be dusk and I saw no one, but uh, just as we got into a uh, dust, uh, 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 an area of uh, darkness, I saw uh, John W. Curtis crawling along the road opposite me and I called to him and and he rolled out in the middle of the road and I asked him to give me a, a, uh, uh, a grip on his butt of his rifle and he takes a muzzle and we'll work our way in. So I was on my back pushing with my right leg and he was uh, on the other end of the rifle pulling and pushing. And so it took us about an hour to get back to our lines. And from there, I went to a, a uh, <clears throat> nunnery where, uh, the floor was covered with GIs on stretchers. So that was about 10 days in Bastogne. And uh, about the uh, eight, nine days later, uh, Pat broke through and uh, we moved out of Bastogne and, and uh, back toward uh, uh, France. Did you have any friends that were lost in the war? 
did you lose any friends in the war? Oh, sure, all of them. I had 128 of them uh, in, the, in the company. So I knew every one of them by name. Half a dozen of them, I knew more about them other than by, uh, in addition to name and other activities that they were involved in. We read our letters, we traded food, we traded uh, gloves, we did everything we possibly could to survive. Our objective was to uh, survive and then complete our mission. So you learn about a lot of people and a lot of different things about those people very quickly. Mm. Was there a concentration camp that you liberated? Did you liberate a concentration camp? No, we did not liberate a concentration camp. The 506 parachute infantry uh, discovered a concentration camp and, and uh, they uh, captured uh, all of the Germans there that were running the, uh, and, uh, and supervising a large group of, uh, of prisoners and held them until uh, 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 infantry came up and took over from that point. I don't remember the name of the concentration camp, but it was a it was about a medium size, and uh, I don't know how many how many were there. I, I don't know. What's one thing from the war that you will never forget? What's one thing? from the war that you will never forget? Oh, oh I stayed alive. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is to preserve yourself and complete the mission. So most of your concentration is, is uh, how can I outsmart the enemy? And you have to be doing that all the time because we were in their backyards and uh, looking in all directions at all at once at the same time and we were always surrounded what were the leadership skills that you learned chaos oh there was a lot of leadership activities going on and we were learning those because uh if if our leader was shot or killed or dismantled dismantled or dismembered uh, something happened to him uh we as uh, other uh members of the platoon or the company had to take over we lost our camp our company commander to a lieutenant of the first platoon so wow. so uh, he was a, he was just a lieutenant while the uh, uh, Robert Phillips, the company commander, was a captain. So he had some new experiences there and he had to train for that for the most part. Um, when the war ended, um, did you celebrate it? Did the war ended, when did we celebrate it? We uh, were in did a you celebrate? No. Because we were concerned about uh, is this true? Is the war ending or is it not? Or uh, <clears throat> what kind of activities are we going to have to uh, undergo as a result of the rumor that the war was ended? No, we didn't celebrate. We just wondered, uh, are they telling us the truth or are they just pulling our legs and getting us ready for another activity? Maybe occupation of Germany for the most part. Yeah. So they tried to talk us into believing that the war was over and it was not because there were pockets of enemy all over Europe that had not yet been captured and they had to be taken out of existence before the war could really be over. Um, when were you discharged? When were you discharged? Oh, well, I was discharged uh, on 1946, about December 22nd. Mm. In, uh, 
the 501 parachute infantry was put on reserve and uh, <clears throat> they uh, were going to deactivate it. And we were given a choice of jumping again and continuing on our military service, but we would be in occupation troops in uh, Germany. We didn't like that idea at all. So most of us, uh, we had gathered uh, points to uh, get out of the military as soon as possible. If you were married, you had 10 points. If you got a medal of certain value, you had five to 10 points. If you were in the uh, combat zone for six months, and you had a Hershey bar placed on your shoulder, uh, that was worth some points. So the minimum points to get out of the military and get home was 72. I had 98 points. So I didn't waste any time like most of the other fellows. There were about 40 of us that did the same thing and we did not jump, make the last jump. Uh, and uh, we boarded ships and went to the Mediterranean area and back to Norfolk, Virginia, took a uh, railroad uh, trip across the U.S. to San Diego. When you said if you had a Hershey bar on you, that was worth points. What was that? She tell her what a Hershey bar was that you had on your uniform. A uh, Hershey bar was uh, a uh, little orna ornament, ornamented uh, gold uh, laced with gold thread uh, raised on a piece of cloth, and uh, it represented six months of activity in the combat zone. So most of us had four. So that means we were in combat for four times six months, two years we were in combat. And we could wear that on our left shoulder uh, just above the cup. So they were called Hershey bars because it, the idea was generated by General Hershey in the United States. So they named it for her. Him, Hershey bars. <laughs> it was not a bar to eat, it was something to see. And I, was about, I was about to say, it, was, it sounded fun when he said Hershey bar. Okay. Um, Did, what, you had another question there? Yeah. No, she, um, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. She thought it was funny that you called it a Hershey bars. Oh, didn't know what a Hershey bar Hershey, was. Yeah, yeah. No, it was uh, it was something to be honored and recognized as a, uh, a valid uh, a point of uh, uh, displaying your combat in military service. Um, at the time you were discharged, were there any long or short term injuries you had? When you were discharged, did, were you uh, suffering from any injuries? I got wounded twice in four years. So once in the leg, once in the arm, uh, another uh, shrapnel wound in the uh, right hand and uh, a second uh, wound in the left leg again before Bastogne. So all Ouch. of those had healed up. So uh, I got a total of four wounds. Two of them were serious, two of them were not. Mm. Were there any medals or awards that you received? What awards did you receive? <clears throat> Combat infantry badge was the most important one. Mm. Can you see it on my, uh, my uh, Jack Gallant and my uh, dress? Mm, I don't, I don't see it. Yeah, combat infantry badge. And it was the uh, bronze star. I got four bronze stars, one for each uh, campaign. Uh, <clears throat> Hershey bars, the uh, 
purple hearts. Yeah, yes, yeah, the purple heart, uh, four purple hearts, but you don't get four purple hearts. You just get one purple heart, which represents all of the wounds that you have received. Mm -hmm. So that was that was the, the general, uh, and then uh, activities uh, toward uh, military medals. I got the Legion of Honor uh, from France uh, after the war also. Mm -mm. You say you say you're wearing one of the medals in your on your jacket. No, he's got his infantry patch on his jacket. Is it okay if I could see it? Yeah, let me see if I can move you in. The top one is his parachute wings, and um, the blue one is the infantry. Can you see it on? Wait, can you move it a little lower? Wait, I can see it. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Is that good? Yes, that's good. And then airborne screaming eagle. Wait, can you move to the um the left? Yes. Uh, uh, I can see it a little, a little. Okay. Uh, that's the airborne screaming eagle. That I can honor. see it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, what was your life like after World War II ended? What was your life? I got, uh, I was in, uh, back in college three weeks after I got home. Finished up uh, my uh, four years of college and then took a fifth year and got my teaching credential, taught for 44 years in two different high schools and one junior college. Um, were there any ceremonies that you went to honoring you and other World War II veterans? Did you attend any ceremonies we, honoring veterans? Uh, their ceremonies were ceremonies and ceremonies built on ceremonies. It's been going on now with interviews and videos for five or six years. And so uh, we know uh, all the fellas and uh, they reunioned uh, the 501 Parachute Infantry reunion in uh, major cities in the United States toward the East Coast. We don't do that anymore because there's so few of us left. What about honor flight? Well, that's- They that, recognize veterans constantly. Yeah, but that's outside of- That's what she's asking. Yeah. Honor flight was a organization yes. that represents uh, all the military units that fought everywhere in the uh, European theater and the Asiatic theater of war. And they go by uh, uh, organizing and being sponsored by individuals and travel to Washington, D.C. and visit uh, for three days uh, the city of Washington, D.C. and all the monuments built there in their honor. Okay. I understand that with the Best Defense Foundation, you went back to Normandy for the 75th anniversary of D-Day, the, the Netherlands for the 75th anniversary of, sorry, the 75th anniversary of the liberation and Pearl Harbor for, for the 80th anniversary of the bombing. Can you tell me about that? Um, boy, I don't know, I can repeat all that. The um, Best Sorry. Defense Foundation and Donnie Edwards uh, has taken Tom to Europe a number of times, uh, even up to the Eagle's Nest uh, two years ago. Uh, he, we didn't go with uh, the Best Defense Foundation for the 75th commemoration um, because we have a team that we call Team Tom mm -hmm. and they put everything together and there were 30 some of us and a good third of them are French people. And we all went with, we all went as a team. But we saw Donnie there and we saw all the uh, veterans that he brought. We made, we made a couple of jumps while we were there that during that period of time. Once again in Normandy and once again in Hull. Yeah, I saw. 
I also understand that you went to Pearl Harbor for the 80th anniversary of the attack. Can you tell me about it? Tell her about our trip to uh, Pearl Harbor for the 80th commemoration. Well, that was just this year, the 80th anniversary. And it's mm -hmm. followed for, for the most part, uh, generally the uh, commemoration of the five years prior to that. So uh, it was a, a large group of uh, veterans uh, from all branches of the service were called upon and uh, uh, they uh, wished to visit uh, generally the area where they had fought before. So us few that were fighting in Europe, uh, we were not generally a part of the directing of the activities in Pearl Harbor. Uh, it was mostly directed toward the United States Navy and other allied nations that fought in that area. Mm. Right, so um, yeah, yeah, I remember um, the Best Defense Foundation took you and, and sorry, the Best Defense took you and other her World War II veterans, I think it was 63, back to Pearl Harbor. Yes, that was the largest group that the Best Defense Foundation has ever uh, taken. Yeah, yeah, we I wish I, yeah, I wish I went with them. Yeah, we're 63 of us in number, and it was a very large group. So <clears throat> we all were supposed to be in wheelchairs because we moved as a group. And if some were walking and some were wheelchairing, it, but the group would have been spread out over a long period of time. So we had to move as a group of wheelchair characters, and we did. Right. And the, uh, the parade that night, uh, was uh, a long, long one in Honolulu. And uh, uh, we almost got lost. We didn't know where we are because we were mixed up with civilians and uh, other military personnel. So it was, a, it was a, a struggle to find our way around uh, the main boulevard as we gave out prizes and uh, little goodies to the kids. Wow. Luck. A lot of people must have came to see the parade. Yes, a lot of the uh, people turned out from all all the islands actually and lined the street. It was uh, really beautiful. And as you said, you would like to go. Mm -hmm. um, I would keep talking to Donnie because he says he's going to take these guys back again. And he's going to take a group to uh, to Normandy this year for the uh, uh, 78th commemoration of uh, D-Day. Yeah, I hope to go some, yeah, I hope to go to Normandy. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like Tom to share the leadership skills that were list, literally pounded into them in all their training, they were faced with chaos over and over and over again. And it was their <clears throat> job to turn chaos into a danger. Uh, so you tell her the four. Oh, well, well <clears throat> we, <clears throat> most of our officers, battalion and higher were, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> were West Point graduates. They were a good bunch. And uh, they had wild idea and supported airborne activities no matter uh, where they were, how they were organized and when they would get going. So uh, they were the, uh, the driving force of, uh, of what we uh, ultimately became. The 101st Airborne Division, the 82nd Airborne, the 13th Airborne, the 15th Airborne. The, those were regiments and divisions all, all put together. Well, that's very, that's very cool. <laughs> so there's another part of that question. What, what, well, so oh, yeah, okay, I got it now. Chaos but, turned yeah. into a danger. Our, our officers uh, uh, had to make 
play and make catch up because the German divisions were 3,000 apiece. 1,000, or rather 3,000 in the uh, first German airborne infantry and 3,000 in the sixth airborne German infantry. We only had 2,000. That's not good uh, uh, activities, but when it's uh, three to two, so we were under, undermined for the most part by a thousand. So we built up to 2,000 from uh, 3,000 from 2,000 and to train properly and quickly uh, because we had, uh, we were being attached to the 101st Airborne Division. The Germans had two regiments in a division. We had two regiments. The Germans had 3,000 persons or soldiers per regiment. We had uh, two, red, two divisions and two regiments, but 2,000 persons or soldiers per regiment. So we're lagging behind. So the 501 Parachute Infantry Regiment was attached to the 101st Airborne Division and we had to train at double time. So in order to do that, uh, uh, some of our officers uh, invented a, a methodology of training and they threw chaos at us every time that we uh, were out in the field, absolute chaos. And we had to work our way as an individual to reduce the chaos to a danger and then reduce the danger to an inconvenience. Reduce the inconvenience to something that we can walk away from and forget it and get on with the battle. So we had to practice those things. For instance, water discipline, 25 mile march, full field pack, and a canteen full of water. An officer would check your canteen to see that if you did drink anything, you got in real deep trouble. Uh, run the obstacle course, uh, chicken liver, pig livers, pig legs. They used everything on a pig, including the squeal, while there were uh, stakes about 18 inches long, attached wire to wire and stake to stake and live ammunition firing above our heads. So if you got your head above the uh, boundary lines there, you were in deep trouble. Uh, all kinds of uh, dangerous activities. We had about 10% casualty just in training. So we caught up as quickly as we possibly could. And uh, by the time we got to Europe, we were attached permanently to the 101st Airborne Division. Now it's 3,000 each for the Germans per regiment and 3,000 each for the American regiments. So the playing ground is even now. But we were at a disadvantage because the Germans held the continent peninsula of 70 miles uh, under strict regulation. And uh, we were jumping in behind them and chasing them all over the place, running them back to their own country boundary lines and told them to never to return again. And in so doing, we brought back to the English speaking people and the French speaking people and all of the Bulgars, the Yugoslavians, uh, return to peace in the form of life, liberty and property and under due process of law. That's, that's very impressive. <laughs> yes, it was our mission. Um, so. So I saw on the, um, when it was your birthday, you you jumped out of a plane for a hundredth birthday. How, what was your reaction with, while doing that? Did you have fun jumping out of the, the airplane on your birthday? Oh sure, that was uh, that was a lot of fun because we knew I knew who I was jumping with. Uh, he was a good friend of mine, and I knew I could count on him. What was uh, his name? Art Schaefer was the uh, uh, jump master with me. I was the only one that jumped. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we jumped at 7,500 feet over the uh, beach at Coronado. 
at the Hotel Del Coronado. And uh, I think the entire city of Coronado came out for that one to see, see the activities that were going on there. And uh, afterwards, we had uh, speeches and we had luncheon. We had a great time and corporate and pictures and everything you can imagine took place over uh, an afternoon of uh, joy and happiness that the Coronado needed. No, I just, I can't believe you jumped out of your plane on your 100th birthday. Well, what's on, <laughs> he, he jumps every year. <clears throat> he only turned 100 once, but all of the cards that are behind him, mm -hmm. there's, yeah, I, see. I stopped putting them up at three, 365. So he has a birthday card from every day in 20, 21 <laughs> boy i'm messed up in 2021 he turned 100 because he was wow. born 1921 and this is how literally the world turned out yeah, and awesome. his his jump on his birthday has is on youtube and apparently has over 2 million views from yeah, all so over yeah i saw the video it was yeah it was incredible Absolutely. There was a um, there was a World War II veteran at during sep last September. He celebrated his hundred and twelfth birthday. Wow, hundred and twelve. Yeah. Um, wow, wow, wow. Yeah, his name was Lawrence Brooks. Oh, did yeah. he live in New York? Say that again. Where did he live? I think he lived in New Orleans. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, sadly, he passed away recently. He passed away on the 5th. Oh, oh yeah, I think I recall something in the newspaper reporting. Yeah, he, yeah, he passed. The, yeah, there was a, um, another World War II veteran. He passed, his name was Richard Overton. He passed away at the age of 112 in 2018. Wow. Yeah. We're headed to New Orleans in April to take a paddle boat up the Mississippi. So, and the World War II Museum in New Orleans is one of the, uh, well, best in the world. So we're really looking forward to that. Tom has been to the museum already. Yeah, I hope to visit them one day. Yes, absolutely. Um, is it, there was actually a World War II veteran in my family. Oh really? Who? No. My grandfather. He was, and he was in the he was a medic in the U.S. Army who was stationed in Japan before the war end officially ended. Oh, that's a tough job. What, what was he? He was in the Pacific oh, before yeah. the uh, war ended. Yeah. He was a medic. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a tough job for sure. Wow. Yeah. But we did yeah. it. Yeah, he was a medic who was stationed in Japan before the war ended. Like, like, yeah, he was um, yeah, he was stationed over there. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. How long was he there? I don't know. In fact, I wish I knew more about his service because he passed away on on August second of twenty twenty. Oh, okay. Oh gosh. Yeah. Um. Yeah. All I knew is he was. He was in the army. He was in the U.S. Army medic as a medic. He was draft and he was drafted, and um, that's basically it. Did he ever serve uh, in Europe or just the Pacific? Pacific. Pacific. That's all. That's all he told me. He was in the Pacific. Okay, because uh, some of the guys continued the fight and went to the Pacific after the war ended in in uh, Europe. Uh, they continued on. We have a historian friend uh, that if it happened in Europe, he could find your grandfather and he could tell you everything you did. So mm -hmm. that's why I asked. He's very knowledgeable. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, um, yeah, that's how I got my my interest in World War II. That that I found out he was that he was a veteran from that war. Uh huh. That's a tough war. Mm hmm.
tough, tough war. The, the, no war is like the next one coming up because all wars are different. Yeah. They're, held, they're held in different places under weather conditions, lots of different uh, weapons, and everything you can imagine is uh, confusion. We're fighting the third world war right now. The only weapons we have is a vaccine. Oh uh, yeah, the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah I really hope it ends soon. soon. Absolutely. And they're calling them uh, vaccine dodgers now. Vaccine dodgers? Yeah, instead of draft dodgers running away, they're running away and refusing to get an injection. Oh, uh, yeah. You think of what Tom and all his veterans were willing to do for our freedom, put their lives literally uh, on the line. Uh, asking somebody to get a shot seems pretty uh, minimal to protect these same people because they're the most vulnerable. The World War II guys, there's not very many of them left and they're the most vulnerable. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I didn't want my grandpa to get to catch COVID and um, I'm just glad he did it before he passed away. Yeah, well, you lost your grandma to it. That's so sad. Wait, can you say that again? You lost your grandmother to it. Yes, yeah, I lost my grandma to COVID. It just isn't, it just shouldn't happen. We've mm -hmm. got the tool, we got the tools. We've got yeah. a weapon that'll put, that'll stop it. Yeah, and people are refusing to, to get the vaccine. Maybe we should just shoot them. We'll line them up and uh, shoot them. <laughs> they would understand that to be war, right? Take away their freedom real fast. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Oh, gosh. So how many more veterans are you going to interview? I don't know, because every time I learn, learn of a new World War II veteran, I... I asked the best defense program director, Ms. Becker, if she has their contact information because I I keep seeing opportunities to hear their story before they're before they um before they're gone. You should uh, go on to Honor Flight's website. Honor Flight uh, San Diego has almost 500 veterans that they literally care for. And wow. their, their main premise is to take them back to uh, Washington, D.C. and so that they can see the memorials to them and the grateful nation. Uh, it's a beautiful experience at the airports. Um, they, you know, people are just lined up uh, red, white, and blue. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. And some of these guys haven't even been outside the house for the last decade and a half. So all of a sudden, wow. somebody thinks they're a hero. And lots of people think they're heroes and they're being treated so well. Honor Flight gets us into all kinds of events. We've gone to uh, football games, baseball games, hockey games. Um, We've gone to golf courses a couple of times and just talked to people as they came through on a different on the whole and just talk to them so that they could talk to a veteran. Uh, they just go out of their way. And with the pandemic, literally their guardians, the veterans guardians that were with them on their trip to uh, Washington DC keeps an eye on them and you know calls them and do you need anything and all that kind of thing. They are amazing. And every single one of them is a volunteer. Wow, that's very incredible. So you should check out Honor Flight San Diego and you'll probably be put in contact with Holly. She's mm -hmm. the uh, PR representative. Um, and you tell her that you uh, just interviewed Tom and you'll go right to the top of the list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Okay. So this, I'll say, wait, he's sorry. I was just going to say what a wonderful experience this is uh, to have your generation care, <laughs> you know, to even acknowledge that uh, these old farts are still out there, you know, and they've got a lot to say. And yeah. the stories are great. And so let's mm -hmm. do it while they're still here. Yeah, because you don't know what you have until, until it's gone. Exactly. We have a lot of young people. Tom talks to at a lot of schools, uh, but we have a lot of people come to the house and just hang out and, and talk. And I always tell them if there was something that touched you, if there was something that you'd never ever read in a history book, uh, remember it and tell somebody else, you know? Um, yep. That's how it stays. That's how the memories and everything about it stays. Maybe we'll stay out of war. <laughs> okay, um, okay, I don't have any more questions. Well, keep talking to Donnie. Uh, he could probably put you in there as a uh, one of his uh, uh, volunteers. Because if he keeps taking so many, <laughs> so many veterans, you may have decided he likes that. It used to be six or eight at the most, and now it's a, you know, hundred. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just something. It's really great. Yeah, it really is. What he's doing is very incredible. I will uh, try to send you. Uh, some of the pictures I took at uh, Pearl Harbor while okay. we were while we were in Honolulu, which is where our hotel was. Um, that's when they got ten inches of rain. Yeah, oh, yeah, I saw I saw <laughs> on um I saw on a video that yeah it was it was raining. Oh my gosh, then some yes. So we it was funny we had unfortunately chose that night to walk away from the hotel and go out to dinner. We had uh, uh, some friends that uh, wanted uh, to take us out to dinner, so we did. And when we left uh, our hotel, you could walk around the puddles. And wow, there were no cars or anything because they couldn't get down the street very well. So you were able to just kind of go around the puddles. Well, when we came out, after dinner, it was up to our ankles standing there waiting to step out on the street. And from there, it went up to your knees. And we just literally were just swimming through the uh, street. But oh I have a gosh. really good video. Yeah. And, uh, of, uh, I mean, the wheelchairs, half the, half the wheel was in the water. Their butts were almost wet. You know, it was uh, <laughs> we'll never everyone okay? that experience. That was an experience. Was everyone okay after that? Pardon me? Was everyone okay? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, we had a good laugh about it. Tom only brought one pair of shoes uh, in addition to his boots, so he was worried he was going to have to wear wet shoes for a while. But literally, it came so fast, and then it left just as fast. It was dry. Everything was fine the next day. Still rained, but it, it wasn't raining 10 inches. Yeah, I'm glad. Wouldn't have stopped you, I'm sure. You would have still had fun. <laughs> okay, well. Well, thank you so much for doing this, and you just keep on doing it. You're welcome. We, we earned, we got all the kinks out now, so <laughs> we'll be able to uh, do it again when you want to. Okay. Thank you, Miss Brenda. Thank you, Mr. Tom. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. You have bye. Her. I do have her. Thank you. <laughs> All right. How do I turn it off? What you do? Here, I'm gonna end it. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Leave. There we are.